going to turn it over to you all to talk about content marketing. So, Fox, take it away. Thank you so much. Hello, beautiful people. Uh, my name is Fox. No, that is not a legal name. I'm not even not Navy Fox, unfortunately. Uh, I go, my name is Jerron Foxworth, but most of the time when I do speaking events like this, no one ever remembers Jerron. Uh, so everyone, but everyone remembers Fox, so we stick with that one. I'm okay with either, whatever folks are both at that current time. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I know Brad was supposed to be presenting. Don't worry, he will be looping into the presentation uh, a ton. Um, and I hope to do the presentation justice. Uh, before we begin, uh, I would love to get like a overview of how the content expertise in the room. So if you currently publish content online, can you raise your hand? And when you publish content online, how often are you doing it? We'd love to. I do three to five times per week. Ooh, you crush it. I wish I could do five. <laughs> <laughs> and weekend. I'm, I'm a freelance writer. I just started contracting with the high dent in my eye, so I'm working on it. <laughs> awesome. You ask? Well, I should ask Laura how often she posts. <laughs> <laughs> Not embarrassing at all. Um, so today what we're going to be talking about is stepping up your content marketing. Uh, specifically, we say, I hate the microphones. I want my voice to carry. Uh, we at Puzzle, we're we're a new company. Uh, obviously, we're a content company, and what we specialize in particular is really companies like yours where there's high domain expertise and you need to tell stories online, and mapping those two things together is the challenge that we want to solve. Uh, so, Brad, if you go to the next slide, just to introduce myself. Again, my name is Jerron Foxworth. I'm the CEO at Puzzle Labs. Uh, my background is actually in developer advocacy. Um, if you're familiar with that, basically it means that I'm a software engineer who talks too much, uh, and I like people. So that afforded me the career where I wrote a lot of content and did a lot of sessions like this and talked with a lot of people, and once I started to grow teams and build teams to actually tell the stories where we hit a new roadblock and then that's where Puzzle came. Brad, I would love for you to introduce yourself. I think Laura did a great job, but yeah, my name is Brad Miller. Um, I've been around UIUC since 2013. Um, uh, just, uh, what else can I say? I mean, they obviously uh, opened and started the PG Smart Lab, so I went and joined Procter and Gamble back in 2017. Spent two years over in Cincinnati and then moved back here when the Smart Lab was opened. And spent the past two, well, I guess two and a half years working there and then left for the startup world. Uh, my background is also in linguistics, so my PhD is in linguistics specifically, how you can communicate most effectively to get things done. Uh, and how we communicate to audiences amongst ourselves, in-group, out-group communication, that type of thing. So that's a little bit of my background. And a little teaser. Just a little bit. <laughs> uh, grabbing the linguist has definitely helped in the content marketing world. <laughs> uh, because we're able to, Brad's able to really look at an audience and the content and figure out, okay, how do we best tell the story? Yeah, next slide. Easier, quicker too. Gotta have these powers. I do not have any problems. No? Alright. So, first I want to address what do you think you hear content? Uh, every time I give a session like this, the things that come up are about influencers. The job here is to not make any of you influencers. That is not what this conversation is about. Uh, really, from the perspective of you looking up online, I'm not a big influencer. My content work has always been in the customer education front uh, for an organization. Like, how do you best get your customers to understand what you're doing, to move them to the next step, to either join your community, to buy your products, to engage with you in a certain way? That's really where uh, my content expertise lies. And it's really beautiful to combine that with Brad's linguistics in his background, because that's how we start to tell these stories. So what, what's happening in today's world, if, and I know you probably all have seen this and experienced this, is we're all now forced to be New York Times editors. 
Uh, there is no doing business to, in today's world without content. Uh, it's how we talk with customers, it's how we engage with customers. So now, that puts the onus on every single organization to figure out how do we tell our story. Um, and, and this is obviously, as most of you probably know, the job of marketing. Uh, marketing teams really work on this, but in this specific context, when you have like a highly technical product or like a machine, Puzzle is an AI company, uh, uh, an AI product, a uh, IoT product, a machine product. Um, you've got to take a slightly different approach to how you educate your customers. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is what that approach looks like and kind of the, the model we're formulating at Puzzle. And hopefully, uh, and this is the goal of this session, is that you all will leave here with a strong idea of like who you should talk to, your audience, where you should talk to them, and hopefully with some content ideas. And we have a short workshop here at the, uh, at the end. Um, before, before I begin talking, and before we kick off things, I would love to ask another question. I, I'm not one of those professor types that likes engagement from the audience, so I'm so sorry in the head of time. Uh, what current content problems do you have? If you could think of it. And to give you some words as you start to think about it, some of the common ones that we hear is that time, cranking out three to five articles. <laughs> It's, it's, it takes a lot of time, it's super hard. Another one is, is, like I mentioned, domain expertise, right? Like our subject matter is very technical. And combining that writer, which is a skill on its own, and then the domain expertise. Uh, so those would be kind of some of the problems. Does anybody want to mention anything? Yeah. I think the one that I really notice is how to make our content different from the others, even though, even though it's very technical, there are also other companies putting out the same content you're writing. Yes. So how do we get different from that? Yes, that's a great one. Uh, yeah, definitely going to talk about that. I'm looking to scale the content creation process from going from me and other expertise to actual copywriting and managing that in an efficient, forward way. That's a big issue. Content marketing changes when it's an individual to a team. Your team to tell the same story. That it gets really difficult. I like that one. Any other problems? I, I, I'm okay with that. I understand. Teaching your users how to think differently mm. um, in terms of, I guess, financially wise, uh, new ways of thinking that they weren't going to or even aware before. Yes, you can load these cards. Uh, can you go to the next slide, right? So, I would like to take off the first idea. Um, I was reading this book. This is from, I don't know if any of you, there's a very big newsletter, it's a business newsletter, it's called Hustle. Um, one of the content writers, her name is uh, um, um, Stephen, Stephanie Smith, I believe. Uh, she wrote a great book, and this is a snippet from, oh, Steph Smith, that's right, it's on the top right, look at me. Uh, and it proposed this idea, and this is kind of like, Really, when you think about not the influencer content model, but our business content model, this is the first step you got to think about. Um, and she calls it the idea, I'm not going to try to And it's really made up of three exact circles. And what your goal is to be here in the middle. Um, so the first thing is obviously interesting. You'd be surprised by how many people missed this one. Uh, uh, it has to be interesting to other people. That is the first thing you want to capture with content. Try to do your best to encourage your team not to self-source these ideas, but find the things that your audience is interested in. That's step number one. Step number two is, and exactly kind of how we already touched on, it doesn't exist in exact form. Uh, this is leading into how you stand out from the crowd. Uh, you want to find out, okay, well, we want to tell this story, and we're not getting it. That's where you want to find your zone. And then you want to combine this with number three. And it's something you can uniquely contribute to. Uh, and a good example of this is uh, there was a company in the book that uh, she mentioned, and it was around uh, the company helped manage local vendors. That was the business. Um, and what they wanted to do was to do a strong content marketing strategy. When COVID hit, they wrote an article about how local businesses were impacted by COVID. That was so critical for their business because that is something that they uniquely can contribute to. 
we're all trying to ask that question. We're all interested in it because we're all affected by COVID. Um, it didn't really exist at the time because we didn't know who has the data. And then now it's something they did uniquely contribute to. That was a very successful content piece for them. Uh, and it was successful because it, it met these three, these three parameters. But I don't want to just leave you with this. We want to help you take it to the next step. I have been a humongous fan of, um, these are called storyteller tactics. They're made by a company called Pipdex. And if you take anything away from this presentation, you should buy these decks. Uh, the, the purpose of why I purchased them was once my job was to train a team to make content, we all have to become consistent on how we tell stories and what kind of stories you want to tell and how we're framing them. And really with this offer, the team was a great framework for us to have a shared understanding. That's the key part there, the shared understanding of what these stories are. And it broke down, uh, there's a whole bunch of cards and we'll leave them here on the table so you can experiment with them. But um, the, at the very root of the cards, they broke them down into these different types of stories. And if you can't read these, uh, the first one is stories that sell. That, that one's not obvious, so we all want to do that. Money is important for businesses. Uh, stories that motivate and motivate you to do something. Stories that convince. I want to convince you of a new idea. Stories that connect. I want to connect with you in my audience. Uh, stories that lead. Just a little hint. This talk is a story that leads. Uh, stories that explain. And stories that impress. Now, you can probably enumerate different types of stories that exist outside the bounds of these. But the really the goal here is your team. Forcing your team into this model, what it allows you all to do is be consistent and have a good understanding. And two, a nice framework for you to build on. And I like the back of the cards because they, there's further works and things you can go through. Um, so when you want to figure out and start to enumerate like how you stand out, uh, how you have proper educate your customers, first pick this. What kind of, and you can do this for actually not only your content strategy, but down to every single story. So let's talk about, uh, we haven't named this yet, so I think we're gonna name it the puzzle model. Uh, and it's not really anything new or fancy, but really this is just a model, a way for you to think about this content so you can increase your workflow. You and your team can start writing those kind of things. And when you break it down, it's, it's really, yes, the team has been the most important thing that we've been talking about, but it's really these three factors. It's who your, who's your audience, um, your environment, and then the outcomes that you want. Uh, the nice thing is that because of these cards, those are your outcomes. You already hit the game, you're done. Uh, so now, that's, that's your outcome. So now let's talk about the audience and the environment. So just to give you just a, a real world example, we're a new company. We're trying to figure out how to tell our story. We're trying to figure out how to start our content marketing world. So before we get into yours, I'll go first. Um, so who's our audience? Really who we talk to are marketing and sales teams at tech startups. Uh, I haven't talked about Puzzle yet, so this is the perfect time to do that. Uh, when we help Puzzle and AI company, uh, the TLDR is you give us your content, and we use AI to help you transform it to extend its life. Uh, what that looks like for our customers is uh, we have one customer uh, that's actually on McBray. Most say they're an IT platform. Uh, when I worked on their content team, every time I would write a blog post, I would then have to support the marketing team and write a tweet, and then I would have to write the blurb for the newsletter, and then it just kept kind of going. So really what we wanted to do was build a tool to make that work a little easier. And where our internal domain expertise lies is, is Brad's a linguist, I'm an expert in customer education. Well, we want to apply that to that audience, marketing and sales teams at tech sales. That's where our expertise is, that's who we want to talk to, that's who we want to engage with. Uh, Brad has an awesome slide later on how you can start thinking about your audience and define it in this way. The next is the environment. And when you think about content, it's important to, it's actually very important to parse out this environment. And I've learned so much recently from Brad on this is that, um, you, you, I think if you're all familiar with the term code switching, mm -hmm. like when you hop into a new environment, you immediately start changing. Like the speaker fox you're experiencing, you're experiencing now is very different if you catch me at a restaurant with Brad later. 
Uh, why? Because you tailor your message to your audience. So it's very important for you to actually parse out the environments. And uh, we wanted to give you just a, a different way to think about this too, because not only when we think about content, everybody goes virtual first. We had a blog, we had a tweet. But the story that I'm telling you right now could just as well be in a blog and a video as it is a presentation. So it's important for you to think about the story that you're telling. The audience, the outcome, the higher level thing. That's how you get your team on the same page. And then all the downstream virtual environments become nuances that you and your team can build on. And then the last one is outcome. So puzzle is outcome. We want to create stories that lead. We want to help teams shape their content strategy. And also we want to explain um, between linguists and customer education, there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot to teach. So these are the so these are the outcomes that we want to target as a team. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So when you mentioned tailoring the story you tell to different audiences, what happens, or what do you think happens when those two audiences come together and to realize that their stories that were being told were different? Does that have any sort of impact on the company? That is a good question. Can I take that? Of course. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. So for those of you who couldn't hear, it's you know, what happens when your two audiences, if you've got multiple audiences, if they hear different versions of this story that was tailored for them, what happens? Uh, most often what happens is when someone sees a story that is not tailored for them, it doesn't resonate the same way with them. And so they may be able to capture that you were trying to get the same thing in two different ways, but more often than not, they're just not even, it's not even going to click with them if you've done your job uh, in, in actually tailoring your story and crafting it for the right audience. This has been a big problem that we've been trying to solve together, actually, is this idea of um, how do you change your audience, take the same content and changing your audience for it. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the differences in, in the nuances of audience variations, but ultimately it comes down to your audience is going to be in a specific environment, and so if they happen across the story that was meant for a different audience, either it doesn't resonate with them or it does resonate with them, just not in the same way. So it's not a it's not a bad risk. In marketing, you'll want to have multiple. Like I mean, this is like marketing landing pages. If you've heard of that concept of just having you get a customer, they come to your landing page, it's specifically tailored for them. If the wrong person lands on the right landing page, then more often than not, I did the wrong, I did things wrong in actually marketing to people. And people are really good at self-selecting. If it's the content wasn't made for them, they won't read it. And, and if, you, if you ever scroll through Twitter, think about your behavior. When something doesn't really catch your eye, what do you do? You keep scrolling. Uh, so I think that's another good, that was cool. Like one perfect example of this, there's this one author that I was reading several years ago. I read, I think it was the third book in a series. And this is total fiction, right? This is this is a fiction writer. I read that book, and it just didn't land. I was I was really disappointed. I just thought the writing style was horrible, and I stopped after the first three paragraphs. Two months later, I went back and started the series from the beginning, not realizing it was the same author, and loved it because I came in at the right place and I was in the right the right space for that. I self-selected out the initial time. I came back and ended up becoming one of my favorite authors and just because I came in at the right time for me. Any other questions? That's a great question. And, and now I want to be clear here. This isn't the finish line. This is the beginning. Like we will have more audiences as the, the <clears throat> tool grows. The, the job here was when we talked to the puzzle team, this gives us the backing for now, we're all under, on the same page about the story that we're telling. We know how we're gonna go to our customers. We know we know exactly who we're talking to, where we're talking to them at, and what we want them to do. Those are the three things. So I'm actually gonna pass this to Brian. So when you're trying to tailor for your audience, you this is, so my background being in linguistics, uh, linguistic anthropology in particular, so this is like social interactions of linguistics, not like computational linguistics, but 
actual social linguistics. And you want to consider the individual that represents the group, right? This is also called a stereotype. You want to find like who is the person that represents a broader group of who my audience is, right? Think of the individual because it's much easier to write for one person than it is to try to write for everyone. If you're trying to write for everyone, ultimately you're writing for no one. And so you want to ask yourself, who is my person and what do they know? That's the first question. What do they know? There are a lot of ways that we can bucket people. We can use demographics. That's more often the, the phrase that people will say and at P&G and other places. I've seen this where they bucket people by race, ethnicity, gender, age, right? There's, there's all of these demographic types of buckets. We ignore, not ignore, but not pay attention so much to those sorts of demographic elements of the audience. Because that doesn't tell you what you care about, about these people, right? What you matter, what, what matters most to us is what do they know? And then how do they know it? So if I learn something just through experience, trial and error, I've been 20 years in the industry and I'm now an expert in X, it's very different from somebody who took four years of college studying that same thing. So how they know it is gonna change how they talk about that level, of, that, that area of expertise, right? I'm gonna pick on you real quick, sure. right? So Nutrien has been spending, was it six, seven, eight years? How long have you guys been there? Uh, around? I'm not there anymore. <laughs> That's right, but, but how? Oh, they've been around for a while, and, right. and uh, right. did a name change in 2018. Okay, so, okay. But you've been around for years. Yeah. You've been doing the thing that you are an expert in for years. That expertise is very well ingrained. And if you were to bring somebody in who studied it fresh out of college, even if they got a PhD in it, you know more in a different way because of that. Yeah. Right? So understanding what do they know so that you can speak about that and how they know it so that you can speak in the way that they learned it. Those are the two most important things that you can ask when considering your audience. Any questions about thinking of your audience? Yeah. I think that's a very interesting way to think about that. But I guess what I'm going to ask is, you know, um, and we do, we're, we're very successful with a lot of different kind of survey techniques. And yeah. I, I'm wondering how to ask those questions yeah. in a way that is very uh, understandable. So I would infer from different variables some of this information, but I think it's probably best to ask it in certain other kinds of ways. So, yeah. We're, you may not know this, but we're actually experimenting on you all right now. <laughs> so it may be obvious, it may not be obvious, but we are experimenting right now. We are talking to our audience. And you notice we've been asking you questions about your content problems and the challenges that you're facing uh, in areas of content operations. That's what matters to us. So go talk to your people. Surveys are really useful at getting the start. It gives you an idea. It gen helps you generate your hypothesis, but ultimately you got to go talk to some people. That's and good for B2B, but I'm in B2C, and I, I've been talked to hundreds of people, but, but, yeah. but I need to talk to thousands, you know? Do you, though? I do. So, so <laughs> are they all 1,000 different from each other? Well, that's, that's a question, right? You know, we yeah. have hypotheses really from user interviews. Okay. But we are a, a B2C product, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so I, you know, and, and to be honest, you, you, you have to establish that relationship to be able to talk with them, right? Absolutely. So, you know, and then it's not like I'm selling a $100,000 product either. So. I think the B2C space and the B2B space ultimately are exactly the same. The only difference is, Someone is in the B2C space buying for themselves most often. Not necessarily always. There are some times where people will be purchasing for someone else. But more often than not, they're buying for their own particular use. Yeah. In the B2B space, you've got a buyer who is buying for the organization. And so there's a different level of risk involved, right? I buy it for myself, it falls flat, that's my own money. And I, okay, whatever. And if it's a low cost, then it doesn't really hurt me that much. Yeah. If I buy the wrong thing that cost me $100,000 to buy in my business and everybody hates it, mm -hmm. 
uh, that's my job, right? Like, so there's, there's a different level of concern there. But it all comes back to, do I need to talk to hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, 1,000 people, or can I get close enough with the smaller level engagements? Uh, my previous company, we spent a lot of time, uh, this was a company called Qualsites, because of the pandemic, we can't actually go into people's homes, right? And so Qualsites does a really good job of getting you into people's homes through their phone to talk with them, to ask them questions, and to get their video responses. There's a lot more nuance that comes from talking to people in whatever way that comes versus just sending out a survey. You can start with the survey because you get a lot of people, but then you'll start honing in on hypotheses of, of specific areas. John, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Uh, there's uh, actually, a great lesson from AI and machine learning here. Uh, I was talking to Brad, and uh, I'm a big component in that we have really good toxicity. The way someone wants to be communicated with on Twitter, it's very different from how they would be communicated on the phone, and it's very different from how they want to be communicated on media. And when you think about your content strategy, like for example, stories that lead work very well on Twitter. Stories that explain work very well in media. So by parsing out your outcomes, what it's going to help you do is figure out where the best places to place your story to give you the most value back. And, uh, and I like this framework because it's kind of like the groupings. So you have all of your paid resources, your targeted resources, social syndication, uh, anything to go viral, and then just kind of like Google. Uh, we're all at the helm of Google in terms of SEO. Um, but, the, but the one thing I want to mention here in this environment as well is stories that lead and stories that explain are also great for workshops and presentations. So really thinking about how to tie your story outcome to the environment is going to be the, the key thing. And here's the outcome. So what I'd like to do now, I'll leave that thing to slide up. Yeah. Um, so what I have here on the table is I would love for you all to now think about the three, the three pillars. Who's your audience? What's your environment? And what outcome do you want? And then I would love to leave you with one additional idea to help frame this exercise. So in the customer education journey, a uh, good mentor of mine, told me about, I have no idea where they got it from, and I can't find it online. So if here in the suit soon, I'm going to take credit for it. Uh, but it's called day zero, day one, and day two. And when you're thinking about, OK, well, this helps me frame the story that I'm telling, but what tells me how to, what, I'm, what to actually say? What, what do I write about? Uh, and you're going to think about this day zero, day one, and day two model. And what it is is that uh, day zero, your customer's first day. They just met you. They just talked to you. They just got on your, your website. What information do they need to get to day one? Day one is that user just solved the problem. They just did your getting started guide. They just performed the key indicator on your tool. And then day two is an expert. And your job when you think about your content strategy is Build the pipeline from day zero to day two. The person who's just came into your organization is going to know, needs to know very different information than someone who's trying to become an expert uh, at your tool. And what now, hopefully, I'd love to give, I watched that, how are we doing on time? Okay, got 15 minutes. Uh, so take the next 15 minutes to think about who's your audience? What environments? Do you best target that audience? And what outcomes would you like to achieve? And really, when you, if you want to get down into the nitty gritty about what you actually need to talk to them about is flow through this day zero through two model. And the one thing I wanted to mention here is that I would highly suggest you come and look at the cards. Because here on the back of each card, and I'll just use one as an example, we explain. Uh, there's uh, workshops here and you can pick up the cards and see what they are but like for this one stories that explain the first one says where do you stand in a world of i can't read this, sorry uh, where do you stand in an ever-changing world because when you explain something the first thing you need to know is what's the current state 
And then the next one is, what side do you take in important battles? So once you know the current state and you know what's going on, you need to now know your position. Where are you on this line? And then what does this strategy, uh, why does this strategy matter to your customers? Now that you're on this side of the line, what's, why is that important for the people you want to talk to? And then, this I love this one, help us see your strategy in action. What that card's job is to do is not to figure out your stance, where you are, and why it matters to your audience, help them see the strategy. What do they need to be able to see this? And then the last one is called story books. And it's really make your story sound interesting. And it's just some tips on how to turn this framing into a hook. Uh, and like I mentioned, I think there's a lot of ways of approaching stories, but I have found that this model paired with this card and the day zero to two model, if you now give your team this document, you can all be on the same page to tell your story and get the outcomes you want out of your content. And before, I want to ask one last time, are there any questions? Was this helpful? Hell yeah. OK, <laughs> take 15 minutes, come up with these things. Brad and I will be walking around. If you want to ask specific questions uh, on how to apply any of these things, obviously, we don't know your business or individual businesses, so it's, it's hard to speak to specifics on these things. But these are some of the higher level ideas and the framings that we use on our team and that we've seen successful in the past. Thank you so much. I uh, hope you made your lunch as valuable with knowledge as full summits. And uh, I'm so happy we're upstairs in the research park. So Brad is actually here full time. I'm visiting in from Alabama. Uh, hopefully I'll be moving back up to the Midwest here soon. So please feel free to come chat with us and talk with us. We'll be happy to work with you. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, the, the way that you take the day zero, day one, day two approach for CPG or for any sort of uh, B2C, that view is the moments of truth. So that's the zero moment of truth, which is the first time they hear about your brand product. The first moment of truth is when they actually purchase your product. What's that experience like? And then the second moment of truth is when they start using your product and do they make the decision to go back and purchase again. So that's that day, day zero, day one, day two works really well in tech when it's a, like a tool that they are purchasing. Uh, you don't really need to worry so much. You want to make sure that you're reducing churn a lot. But if you're a B2C and your focus is selling a good, a product, um, then the, the zero moment of truth, first moment of truth, Z mod, F mod, S mod is a, a good way to approach it. Thank you. We're here, so ask questions. If you want help brainstorming some ideas, we can do that too. Thank you all so much.